What up, everybody? Hey, Jimmy Jet here. I wanted to jump in real quick and make a slight correction to some information that we talked about in this podcast. We claimed that the Rubicon Trail is closed, and actually, it just opened. Hallelujah. We did this recording on the 31st of January. The next day, the trail actually opened, so that is great news. El Dorado County has claimed that they went into the Rubicon area, had assessed some of the situation that's going on there, and deemed, shockingly to all of us, I know, that the trail is under snow and there's no mitigations that need to happen. So they've opened the trail once again. So uh, we do reference the trail being closed in this episode. There is some good content in there, so I chose to leave the content there. But I wanted to make this correction before everything went on so that you guys know the correct and good news that is out there. So big thanks uh, once again for uh, listening to Snail Trail 4x4 Off-Road Podcast and enjoy the show. Welcome one, welcome all to the Snail Trail 4x4 Podcast. If you like going off-roading in Toyotas, wrenching on Toyotas, camping in Toyotas, and maybe even poking a little bit of fun in Toyotas, and of course, hearing about how fantastic brake calipers are on Toyotas, then this is the podcast for you. That's right, ladies and germs, my name is Tyler, and joining me on this episode, number 369 of the Snail Trail 4x4 podcast, is the one and only Mr. Jimmy Jet. James Jimbo Jimbalaya. Jimbalaya is still my favorite name. How are you doing, buddy? I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. I'm, I'm very proud of you, actually. You are? Why? I am, because I, I got the joke right? No, oh. because you didn't <laughs> giggle with this uh, episode number. 369? Yeah. Why would I giggle at that? It just seems like something you would do. I'm, I don't know why. Uh, probably. Yeah. I don't blame you. Mm-hmm. I don't blame me either. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. He couldn't hold it, ladies and gentlemen. He couldn't, couldn't hold, hold it back. It. I couldn't hold it. That's a great number. Yeah. 369. Uh, 369. Yeah. Things are going well. How, yeah. are, how have you been? Uh, been good. Yeah, I had a I had a really fun weekend. We'll talk about it a little bit here, but mm-hmm. uh, I, I figured out some things too. Oh, congratulations! I know I'm figuring out life. It's great. Yeah, it's, it's about great. time. Fantastic. <laughs> it's, just, it's bound to happen sooner or later. Right? Maybe not. A whole uh, fifteen years later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wait, how old am I supposed to be then? Fifteen, I think. Oh, okay. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Mentally or physically? Mentally. <laughs> Mentally yeah. <laughs> so anyways, yeah, we're sitting here for episode 369 at the Snail Trail Studio, which is about to get a, a not a makeover. What would be the right term? A shift? A, a new relocation? Relocation. That's, that's a good one. Yeah. About to be Exciting relocated. News. Yeah. We've, we've discussed it at one point mm-hmm. uh, slightly, but yeah, more flight warehouse is growing. Yes, it is. And moving to a new location and expanding almost mm-hmm. threefold. Threefold, yeah. Dang. I'm tripling the square footage. <laughs> That's nuts, dude. <laughs> I'm still in a corner of a garage. <laughs> but, you know, I don't... It's, it's easy. It's simple. It's, it's nice. <laughs> There's that, for sure. You don't have all the extra headaches that mm. I've, I've been having. I don't lately. have four Yahoos working behind me. Dude, those guys are a freaking handful. Like if we ever get an actual HR department, we're going to be fucked. You can't. I know. You're going <laughs> to have to fire to. them first. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Uh, I'm surprised I made it through HR for 10 years. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I w- I'm not nearly as bad as they are. No, you're 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 sneaky, though. That's yeah. I had they're, to be. Yeah, <laughs> they're not. <laughs> I'm just, did I ever tell you that when I left that corporate job, I put a I created a whole scavenger hunt. Yes. You, you have told me, I don't know if you've told the podcast. Though. Yeah. When I left, I, I forgot what the first one, what first clue was, but I think I, it was a memo on the memo board yeah. about that looked very formal. Uh-huh. And since I was the graphic designer, you know, I mocked up a formal letter from the company uh-huh. and it more or less said, you know, it get, it did some like random words. And then uh-huh. it just said like, Hey, Jimmy Jet here. I, I, I created a scavenger hunt. It's hidden throughout this building. I hope you enjoy it more or less. <laughs> and I alluded to the first clue somewhere in there. Mm-hmm. And then it, it went for like five or six clues throughout the building. And then mm-hmm. I 
hit a hundred dollars somewhere oh, in nice. the building. Yeah. And it was six or eight months later before somebody even uh, <laughs> said, mentioned or called, contacted me to say, oh my gosh, we just found the scavenger hunt. It's six to eight months. Yeah. <laughs> this memo sitting on the board. Of this memo. Like, yeah, who the hell reads those memos? <laughs> yeah. So anyways, yeah, it took, um, it took him a few months to like a f- half a year to find it. Uh-huh. And then it took him almost like eight months to solve it. Wow. And I didn't give him any, <laughs> any hints or tips. Yeah. I d- alluded to something once because I found out that the company was uh, downsizing and I didn't want the area that they were vacating that clue to go away. Uh, and it was the next clues that clue that they were on. Uh, so I, uh, <laughs> I alluded to it and then they were able to solve it actually from there. But nice. Yeah. So yeah, that was fun. I don't know how we got on that topic, but I don't either, but it's a oh, fun one. HR and hoodlums. That's uh, how we did it. Yeah. Hoodlums and HR. That'll be probably the last department we hire at more fleet. Yeah. <laughs> and or it's just, just going to be because death. OSHA is going to come in and say, all right, you guys, <laughs> you need an HR department. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, things are going really well. Uh, we, I was going to talk about this later in the show, but um, I'll do it now since we're kind of on that topic. Okay. We've had a lot of amazing support from the community with more a lot yes. of amazing support from uh, the off-road industry um, and the off-roaders out there. And so, you know, a big thing that I like to do, and one of the goals I set out with this company was to be able to give back to off-road trails. Yeah, this is so as cool. Well. And so I remember kind of this time last year, I made an announcement that in 2021, we were able to donate. It was like $17,500 right around that number. So I think it was like 1748, something like that. Okay. Uh, Back to uh, off-road trail organizations and off-roading communities, you know, uh, and around the country, right? Mm -hmm. This year we were able to donate 24,000. Was it 800 or 300? I thought it was 28,400. No, I think it's 24, eight, 24, eight. Yeah. 24, okay. eight. So $24,800 back to nonprofits and trail advocacy organizations. Yes. That is so cool. It's super fucking cool. And that's just what I kept account of throughout the right. year. And there's some other things I realized afterwards that I didn't keep track of. And that sure. But, understood. And that wasn't strictly cash, right? That was product and it was all that product, you donated yeah. and yeah. okay. Yeah. Yeah. It was all product in the forms of that's the retail value of how much product we donated to raffles to a lot of raffles. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, off-road clubs that are doing a bunch of trail maintenance stuff and they wanted to do a raffle just for the club at their trail maintenance thing. Any kind of fundraisers that got put towards blue ribbon coalition, tread lightly United four wheel drive association, Cal for Corva, Friends of Oceana Dunes, we had some too. Uh, Southern Four Wheel Drive Association. There's a bunch of them, um, uh, quite a few trail advocacy orgs out there in the United States. And so I know that I've talked a little bit about it in the past that more off road companies need to be stepping up and kind of standing their ground when it comes to fundraiser requests. And so what I've done is, you know, if it's a nonprofit organization that is getting the funds for a fundraiser raffle, whatever it is that the fundraiser is, I use, I'll donate something, something around $200 in value, right? For more flight. And if some of the proceeds, like just some of it is going back towards a trail advocacy organization, we'll donate $600 oh, wow. worth okay. of product. So we're, we're tripling the donations. If organizations come to us saying, Hey, we're looking at some of these funds going back to Blue Ribbon Coalition or right. Cal Four or Rubicon Trail Foundation, whatever it is. And so I'm definitely standing behind that as a commitment for the company. And I'm just trying to hopefully make a call out to consumers out there, other companies, off-road companies, if you're listening, we need more funds put back into our trails. And uh, there's a lot of legal lawsuits um, nationwide. So pick a trail advocacy organization near you and donate 20 bucks. Yeah. So it goes a long ways to helping fight a bunch of the, the expensive lawsuits going around. Absolutely. They, they all can use our help and mm-hmm. um, massive congratulations to Morflate and donating so much time and energy and monetary value product to 
these people that can do good to our community. Mm -hmm. So nice job. Thank you. And yeah, that all comes back down to, you know, bringing it back around is it's, it's, we only can do that because of the support that we get from consumers in the industry. So thank you guys for supporting more fleet. And, um, if the more you continue to support more fleet, the more that we get to give back towards trails. So it's awesome. Yeah. It's cool stuff. And so with that as well, uh, more fleet is going to be expanding quite a bit this year. (laughs) And uh, we have a couple of really big product launches planned. And in order to do that, we needed a bigger warehouse. So we're getting keys hopefully tomorrow, crossing my fingers. Nice. For going from a 2,300 square foot warehouse to 9,300 square feet. Wow. That's insane. Yeah. It's pretty crazy to think about that all this just started because I was lazy and didn't want to squat at tires anymore. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And it's grown into the behemoth it is now. Oh yeah. It's, it's a monster. Yeah. That's enough about more flight. Okay. (laughs) We'll have um, some winners to announce when we get back from King of the Hammers about the uh, winners from January, which was the two single tire inflators. On the last episode or one of the last episodes we did, we, you had a really hard time pronouncing that. Yeah. And a listener wrote in and said, you should call them the single blowers. This, <laughs> I had somebody else write into me and said, we should call it the more flight STIs the STI. <laughs> for single tire inflators. But obviously there's a, a fun dual. Yes. Dual. That's pretty good name there. <laughs> I like it. Right. I was like, I could see us doing that. <laughs> Too bad. You need to start holding back the products that you're going to release. Cause we could pull the audience for product names. Oh, that would be fun. Yeah. Yeah, I've I've gone back and forth with talking more about future releases on the podcast, and I decided that I can't do that after I actually had a listener become a direct competitor to Morflate and started making essentially the exact same thing of what the first or second iterations of Morflates were. You're right. And I was like, well, all right, there goes that. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Sorry, listeners. No more talking about it. Yeah. That's, uh, that really does suck. Yeah, man. Good stuff rolling along. Well, we have STIs in stock. So if anybody wants an STI, contact more flight. <laughs> Jimmy's raising his hand. He really wants an STI. <laughs> I do. <laughs> yeah. A Subaru. <laughs> yeah. I have STI seats in the Forerunner. Oh, that's true. They're comfy. I only have WRX. Mm, loser. I know. <laughs> Wow, wow, wow. <laughs> oh man. Yeah, man. So let's see what else do we got for Thursday's episode here? Well, we will be announcing the giveaway for February mm-hmm. in, in Monday's episode. Yep. Uh, we've with our big announcement that's coming mm-hmm. up. So get ready for that. It's a, uh, it's a doozy and full of some fun knowledge and some new things going on. Mm-hmm. So that'll be good. And we will go over all the items in uh, February's giveaway and what, we added it up and it came out to be like 200, $250 yep. of uh, items. So uh, mm-hmm. congratulations to a lucky winner of that. And mm-hmm. if you want to get in for the giveaways, you can do that over on irate four by four and then go down to the look, watch, listen, something like that. Watch, watch listen, listen, discuss, watch, listen, discuss section, and then go to snail trail four by four forum. And then their sign up options are either at the bottom on mobile or on the right on the desktop. Cool. That's a good, good stuff over at I rate four by four. Let's see what else do we got. Oh, we're still waiting on Mr. or Mrs. Red Rocket Hot Pocket to get in contact with us. Yep. They haven't messaged me. Nope. Haven't messaged me. So that's for episode or that's for 450 reviews. Mm -hmm. And so now we're on the home stretch to 500 reviews. Once we get to that 500 review, we will be giving away a winch. Yes. But Red Rocket Hot Pocket was one at uh, the 450, re- 450 review. And so we got a swag pack for you. Mm-hmm. Uh, we just need to know where to send it. Yep. And so we got that. If you guys have been holding off putting in a review until we get closer to 500, now is the time. Because if you put in a review at 501, you are not going to be included in a chance to win the winch. Nope. Not at all. Sorry, not sorry. Right. <laughs> You've had like two and a half years to get in. <laughs> yep, yep. So yeah, make sure you guys are going over there. The reviews got to be put in on iTunes. Unfortunately, as much as I hate Apple stuff, um, iTunes does control the review podcast review industry. <laughs> they have a nice, strong stranglehold grip on that industry. So unfortunately that's where you got to put it in at. And so if that means making an iTunes account in order to win a winch, Good luck. I hope you can do it. 
I heard a really interesting stat. Really? And I don't believe it. Okay. But they said, and it was on a podcast talking Mm -hmm. about YouTube podcasts. Okay. They said over half of the podcasts consumed are on YouTube. What? That's what they said. Like they consume it through YouTube via YouTube? They use YouTube as the audio player. I don't believe that. I don't believe it either. I can't imagine that's true. Why is iTunes such a powerhouse? Yeah. If half of all podcasts being consumed are on YouTube. Yeah, that doesn't being, make any sense. Are being viewed on YouTube, consumed mm, on YouTube. I'm skeptical. Yeah, I'm not <laughs> Okay. Glad we're on the same page. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. Anyways, okay. Continuing on. I gave Andrew his winning from whatever that December? was. December. Yeah. I gave him the winning for that. Cool. And I brought in my present to uh, Let's Go Brandon. <laughs> For Brandon? Yes. <laughs> nice. Good job. I have not brought my present in yet. Okay. So I need to, I'll need to do that, I guess, before KOH. So That's this week. You yeah, said. That's right. Okay. <laughs> I, I do need to do that. Cool. We can make that happen. <laughs> awesome. So, uh, yeah. So we'll be sending those out before mm-hmm. Tyler leaves for King of the Hammers. Yes. By Friday, hopefully. Yeah, hopefully by Friday. Let's see. What else can we talk about here? Do we got? I can't think of anything. I can't either. So let's move on then, shall okay. we? Okay, cool. We are doing Thursday episode, so we get to talk about what we've been up to. Yep. Mm-hmm. First thing I wanted to talk about Okay. on the docket, there's a bunch of different things. Yeah. So, okay, here, let me, we'll need, I should probably write this down as a list, but we have a Bronco update. Yes. Oceana Dunes update. Okay. Rubicon Trail update. Okay. Four Wheel Underground update. Yes. Maybe a Toyota Sequoia update. Ooh, okay. <laughs> a snow wheeling update. Yeah. And an electronic parking brake caliper update. Wow. Okay. And that's all yours. And that's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. Cause I don't have that much. Let's see. What did I do? I, on Wednesday afternoon, uh, last week, I recorded a music video. You, oh, that's right. We're talking about, did we talk about the podcast about that? I don't know. I don't remember. I don't remember either. Um, yeah. My younger brother is in a band and they want, they went on tour last year and they did a small little tour and they want to do it again. But they said that last year, a lot of um, company or uh, gigs wanted to see videos of them playing. Uh, and so uh, they rented a little space and uh, we recorded a song for them so that they can send it off to somebody Nice to try and get some more gigs nice. on that for their tour. So I went and uh, borrowed a, a Ronin, which is a DJI like steady cam sort of okay. thing from Taco Dial, uh, right. who is a, a film photo guy out here in this area that I did a, a tailgate panel for. And he let me borrow the Ronin. And then I used the new black magic camera oh, that I got. Okay. The downside to that camera. Well, two bit, two downsides is it, choose through batteries. So I, I need a few more batteries or I need a way to power, keep it powered. Okay. And I'm shooting six K is the other thing, which is insane. Yeah. And so it just choose through data storage. Mm -hmm. Um, I threw in a 250 gig card and I had like filled up in 90 minutes (laughs) of footage available to me, which was plenty because the battery would only, it only lasts like 10 to 15 minutes. Jeez. But so now I'm going through the editing process with the black magic camera and I'm learning a lot because I'm, it shoots in raw. And so now I'm learning how to color grade and something. Mm. So it's pretty fun. It was fun to be able to help my brother out and get this video out here, hopefully, you know, within a week or so. Nice. And let's see, uh, besides that, I did some small work on the house. I removed the sub floor on, uh, in the master bathroom and it actually has a lot more water damage than oh. I had anticipated it having. Okay. And so I might have to remove the, the plywood flooring in uh-huh. that room, but it was, has been a bathroom that has been un, more or less unchanged since the early seventies. <laughs> so, I mean, I guess it should probably, it might be time for some updating in that, yeah. on that flooring section. Besides that, we removed some wallpaper. The mini assistant came over the other day and helped me remove wallpaper, which she finds a lot of fun in for about <laughs> 20 minutes. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and then she's like, I'm bored. And I'm like, all right, get out of here. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then yeah, panels, 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 and, uh, making new panels, uh, mm-hmm. which we'll talk about, uh, what's coming up probably when, uh, they get done at the laser Gotcha. and I deliver them to powder coating. Nice. 
That'll be exciting. Okay, I'm done. You're done? I th- well, probably. Yeah. I d- when is the mini assistant going to start helping you with the popcorn ceilings? Uh, <laughs> well, she's not allowed to eat it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I don't think she will. I bought this cool contraption, though, that uh, ho- hooks up to my shop back. Because oh. the easy way to remove popcorn ceilings, which is probably not the OSHA correct way to do it, is you water the ceiling so mm-hmm. that it's uh, you know a little bit damp. Okay. Because it probably has asbestos in it. Okay. And asbestos <laughs> is bad when it gets airborne. Yeah. So if you water it, it falls it, straight it down. It falls straight sense. down to the ground. Right? Okay. And so usually the way I've done it in the past is you water it down and then you get a big putty knife and you tie it, tape it to a broom handle and then you just <laughs> scrape the roof and then yeah. all of it flops down onto the ground. Okay. Which is not the correct way to do it. It's just <laughs> the cheap way to do it. And then you have to figure out a good way to dispose of it. Mm-hmm. But I just bought this contraption that connects to my shop vac that has the putty knife on it. So then you scrape and then and the shop vac sucks it all up. It collects it and the shop vac sucks it all up. Ah. So you still put it a little bit damp uh-huh. and then you just scrape it off and then the shop vac sucks it all up for you. Yeah. That's nice because it'll collect it. But what I'm concerned about is that if any of the airborne, if any of it is airborne, then the shop vac's just throwing it throughout the room. <laughs> yeah. So I'll be double masking some, or something. Uh, some redo the filters in the shop vac first. Oh, I'm going to redo that. Yeah. And I'm going to get, they make bio decomposable bags. Oh, nice. For the shop vac. So for then I can yeah. just, so it'll be like a plastic bag liner. So it'll suck it all up and then I can, you know, wait till the shop vac's a little heavy and then pull that bag out and put another one in and just go from there and then have like a bunch of decomposable bags and then yeah. dispose of it air quote the proper way. The pro- uh-huh. I don't know how I'm going to dispose of it. I'm, I'm really kind of curious about mm-hmm. taking it to the dump and saying, Hey, I've got some things that have asbestos in it or calling the asbestos people and say, Hey, can you come pick this up? Yeah. Or burying it in my backyard. I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> Ship it to Mexico. Yeah, maybe <laughs> let's put it in one shipping container. Uh, oh, got any returning back to their home country? Yeah. <laughs> Can you throw this in there, please? Uh, that's funny. Cool, man. Yeah. So you don't have that much uh, demo demo left until you're I, building. Right? I really don't have a lot of demo left. I Maybe you have to do a little bit more. The The bathroom, the uh, master bath that I've been working on is pr- completely gutted now and ready for d- figuring out how we're going to design it. Okay. And the assistant and I are going back and forth trying to figure out uh, the best way or yeah. what we want. Okay. The assistant wants a bigger bathtub than really than what fits in the room. <laughs> uh-huh. So that's our one of our big holdups. The guest bathroom on the upstairs, I'm going to remove the linoleum and remove the subfloor and we're going to tile that one eventually. Okay. Uh, then popcorn ceiling and wallpaper. And I think I'm done doing demo. Nice. Yeah. That's so exciting. I really need the assistant to figure <laughs> out what she wants <laughs> uh-huh. because I'm, if I worked a week, I could be done. Yeah. And ready to just start building. And I need to know kind of what direction we're going to go. Bring me and I'll be your designer. Yeah. I'm, I think she wouldn't mind that. Really? It's funny because I'll, <laughs> I was trying to push her to, mm-hmm. to figure out tile, uh, flooring tile for the master bathroom. I'd say, what about this tile? You know, and I was on Google or whatever on my phone mm-hmm. and she's like, I don't like it. And then I, what about this one? I don't like it. What about this one? I don't like it. What about this one? I don't like it. I'd hate the way that that wall looks. I'm like, babe, we're looking at the tile, the tile on the floor. The floor. <laughs> she's like, oh, I have to see the whole bathroom. I'm like, oh my gosh. Wow. I'm like, okay, I need you to go through Pinterest or whatever it yeah, is yeah. and f- start pinning things you like. Th- not the rooms, because I room, guess she can't she view a whole it. Room, uh, she, yeah. It's a whole room thing Jeez. for her. It's not a, I like this wall. I like the way that this mirror is done. Mm-hmm. I like the setup on this bathtub, or I like the way this shower is laid out. It's, I don't <laughs> think it's that. Huh. You know, for her, it's like, I need the whole, I need to see the whole feel. Interesting. So I'm like, okay. You know, I would assume that some, <laughs> some people could go, I like this flooring and I want to match it with this tile for the bathroom and yeah. I want, or for the shower. And I want to have this style of this color walls in the bathroom. And I want to, you know, I like this faucet or whatever mm-hmm. it is. So uh, the assistant is not that way. Apparently. Gotcha. See, I'm terrible at that. I can't, I can't figure out what goes well together. Like colors. Oh. I have zero concept of what colors go together. Yeah. 
And so I can't look at something and be like, oh, let's put that with that over there. Because the secretary goes, those colors don't go together. Oh, sure. <laughs> what do you mean that color doesn't go together? It's two fucking colors. Put them together. <laughs> right. Yeah. I I get it. I'm a graphic designer, right? Yeah. Or I have been for a long time. So mm-hmm. I kind of get it a sense of what kind of things go together. You know, it's funny because when my parents were at the near the conclusion of remodeling the the my old house, their new house, they wanted to paint the front door a different color. Uh, right. Uh-huh. And they had two, they put a, two swatches up on the door uh-huh. and they were trying to decide which one they liked. And I, they they asked me because they know I'm okay with colors. I was like, I don't like either of them. <laughs> <laughs> and I, they, the next day they came back to me with like two or three swatch cards that had like six colors on them. Yep. And I was like, I like this one. And I, I don't even remember what it was, but it was, it was a tealish color somewhere between the two colors that they had on the door. Okay. And then the whole family came over for Christmas, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And they asked everybody what colors they thought looked good. And pretty much everybody more or less chose two colors. Mm -hmm. And one of the two colors they chose was the color I chose. Yeah. Nice. (laughs) And so they're like, okay, we're going with that color. (laughs) Perfect. So I'm okay at that stuff. Uh I think, but it's just as much as it is my house, it doesn't matter what we put in the house. (laughs) It all falls onto what the assistant wants. Yep. And if I made a choice and she doesn't like it, then I get vetoed. You uh-huh. know, it's, that's uh-huh. just the way it is. Cause it's, cause guys don't walk into a house. I've, I've, this is a funny story. So I've, we walked into a house the other day and she said, I really liked the tile that they had on their backsplash in the kitchen. And I was like, I did not even, didn't, notice. That didn't, didn't register. even notice. <laughs> they and had she's like, how did you not notice? And I was like, did you see the truck they had in the driveway? <laughs> yep. She's like, uh, no. I'm like, how did you not even notice? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, I don't notice that stuff. I notice the automotive things. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, she often says I have a wandering eye for trucks. I don't uh-huh. have a wandering eye for girls, which I guess I hide very well. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to try to keep it that way. Uh-huh. <laughs> but I, you know, I will point out a truck and things like on oncoming traffic or things mm-hmm. on the side of the road and, you know, or whatever. And she's, she doesn't give a flying hoot, you know, yeah. or, she'll point out something in a, the way that the decor in a house is. And I'm like, whatever, I don't care. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it doesn't matter to me, mm-hmm. you know, and I need her to make these decisions so I can move on. Yeah. Fair enough. Well, cool. But we have uh, something else to do today too. Oh, that's right. So, um, this here we is got a gift from a listener or uh, a present or a, something came to us in the mail. How about that? Yes. But it says from Ford ice something. It says four. Four. For Yoda Tyler. Oh. <laughs> and Mr. Jeep and Jimmy Jet. Oh, who's it from? <laughs> if I tell you who it's from, you're going to know what it is immediately. I don't know if. Oh, well, I'm guessing it's from JD Wheeler. Uh, no. Nope. Didn't he make us these <laughs> seats? I made these seats. Well, I mean, the t shirts that are. Oh, on the, the t shirts. Yes. Uh, Kevin did. Yeah. But it's not from Kevin. Okay. Uh, if I tell you the name, you're going to know what's in it. But I think if I pull out and show you what's in it, you're going to know exactly who it is. All right. Let's so, play, which way let's do you want to play it? a game? Which way do you want it? Uh, tell me the name. Jake Gallo. I have I, wine. No. Nope. I don't know. Okay. Hold on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's like solid. So he's in the almond Al- industry. Almonds. Almond industry. Almonds. Almonds. I can't open it. I know. It's very well packaged, Jake. <laughs> Holding a microphone trying to open these does not work very well. Yeah. Oh, there's no. <laughs> oh, that is. I'm glad I you warned me. Yeah. I would have totally opened it and had these go all over the floor. <laughs> is that a good almond? It is literally a box full. It's a five pound box of almonds. Full of almonds. Very no tasty. packing material. It's, it's filled to the brim. You're breaking like your number one podcasting rule right now. I am. I'm sorry, everybody. <laughs> Never, ever eat on podcast. No, okay? It's annoying Don't to the ever listener. do it. It sucks. I don't know. To listen I can to. just hear you munching. I'm going to have to fast forward to this whole section now. You fast forward through the whole episode anyway. <laughs> Those are good. They're tasty. They do some good almonds, man. I'll take the... He's given me a bag before, and I've taken it and just sprinkled like powder salt on it. Okay. 
And you so you get some salted Powder, powdered salt. Yeah, so not like crystallized salt. Oh, is it like powdered sugar? Kind of. It's just it's just really really tiny grains of salt, yeah. rather than okay. being like what you typically see in like table salt. Sure. Mm-hmm. Um, kinda, and they're fantastic. I'm gonna have to use some of your packaging tape to put this back together yeah, right. for me to take home. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Thanks, Jake. Yeah, super cool. Thanks, man. I hope yeah. the almond business is going okay with all this rain. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. So that's the first thing on today. Or I guess the second or third thing. I don't Seventh, know where we're at. Whatever we're at. Uh, next one. Let's do All a right. quick update on the Bronco. Everybody Broncos. wants to know about the Bronco, especially me. <laughs> so I got an email last week mm -hmm. from Ford. Okay. Saying, fuck you. That's all it said. And I was like, cool, perfect, done. <laughs> Next topic. <laughs> what do you mean? No. What? So yeah, apparently Ford has fucked up the Broncos so bad, the production of them. Yeah. That they are telling everybody that you cannot have a Bronco with a hard top Sasquatch package or um, a Lux interior package. Okay. If you have any of those three items, you have a less than 1% that your Bronco is going to get built. Really? If you have not had a Bronco built yet, less than 1%. Wow. Yep. They said that uh, the production for 2024 is coming up. Usually they start around July, July-ish, July, uh, yeah. uh, July, August. So with uh, the 2024 production coming up, they said anybody who has an order in the system right now and has an order in the system before... 2024's orders. Yeah. They're going to clear all of them, cancel every single order. Really? Every single order in the system is getting canceled. Wow. And you're going to have to replace your order as a 2024 model with no price protections whatsoever. Seriously? Mm hmm. Wow. So I've had a Bronco on order since March 11th, 2021. And one of the big, you know, main reasons of doing the pre order. And submitting your hundred dollar deposit to Ford, which was really an interest free loan for them from the from the sure. the everybody. Yeah, they you know, two and a half years. <laughs> yeah, two and a half years they've had your hundred dollars. Yep, and and they're going to cancel the order. So, not only that, but they are they've also given a twenty five hundred dollar incentive to pick any other vehicle than a Bronco. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yep. So you could have anything else. Anything else. And you get $2,500 off. Yep. Oh, that doesn't We're, sound too bad. That doesn't sound too Not bad. Not for a $100 deposit. Right? You make $2,400 out of it, yeah. essentially. But then you think about it and you remember that there's a $10,000 market adjustment on all vehicles right now, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> yes, oh, there is. Sweet. I got. I made $2,400, but I'm still losing $7,600. <laughs> <laughs> with the market adjustment, the $10,000 market adjustment. Would, so would you lose that if you got a Bronco regardless though? I believe so. Yeah. So yeah, that's sort of a wash. Yeah. But no, nah, that sucks, man. Yeah. So I'm kind of like, I don't know. I've, if, if I was doing this with my business, <laughs> I wouldn't be in business anymore. <laughs> yeah. Right. And so I'm kind of like, man, that's just like shitty, shitty planning, shitty customer service. And like somebody really fucked up their job in what planning out the production for these things. Yeah. What is the issue? Like, why can't they offer you those three things? I'm not sure what the Sasquatch and the Lux package is about, but they did have issues with the hard tops. The original hard tops they ordered from the, the original company they were contracting with didn't seal them properly. And so there was a lot of leaky hard tops out there. And so uh, Ford did the recall on the hard tops and the Broncos and also tried to switch manufacturers. Apparently they can't find another manufacturer to manufacture their hard tops now. Really? Yeah. Nobody in the world apparently can manufacture the hard tops. I'll do it. Right? <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. It just boggles my mind. A company as big as Ford can't figure out how to produce hard tops for a vehicle that they engineered and designed. Why can't they do it themselves? I don't know. It's a great question because they rather build other things. Apparently that would be my guess. Yeah. Yeah. My, my guess is they have a shit ton of mock E's right now. 
I bet. Yeah. They have a so, lot of, they have a lot of Mach-E's to sell because mm-hmm. nobody wants to buy one yep. except for Rodney. Except Rodney. Yeah. And they ha- all, they want to continue to sell the F-150. They mm-hmm. don't want it to lose the number one spot. No. Yeah. And they have made a bunch of money off of the loans of a hundred dollars mm-hmm. and yep. said, thank you. And then our, if you want to get another vehicle, here you go. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, pretty much at this point in time, the secretary and I have pretty much given up on ever getting a Bronco. (laughs) I don't think it's ever going to happen. Um, and at this point, it's kind of being after how Ford has treated all its customers. I'm kind of like ready to say, fuck you to Ford. And I'm kind of done with Ford for the rest of my life. (laughs) So you're going to get rid of your Ford thinking about it. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Wiping it all the way off. huh? I'm debating it. Like I, I put a huge value on companies treating people properly. Yes. And treating people do. correctly. Yep. Um, I don't want to support companies that treat customers like shit. I, I don't know. I don't know how else to say it. Like, I don't know. I just, I don't believe that they should be rewarded for treating customers that way. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. So after that, we got that email. I was talking to talking to the secretary about it and I was like, Hey, look, here's the reality of the situation. We can keep our order in. I'll delete the Sasquatch package off of our order. We didn't have a Lux package interior to begin with, but the hard top is non-negotiable for us. We want the hard top. It's a safety reason for her more than anything else. So it's not a, a sound issue of soft tops. It's not a removability thing of hard of soft tops versus hard tops. It's a, it's a safety in crash test issues for her. So, uh, that's non-negotiable. So we're going to keep the order in the system. If we're the one, less than 1% that gets our order pulled, then cool. We get our order pulled, but if not, we're just we'll probably just get our hundred bucks back and <laughs> go get Move some steak on. dinners. I don't know. <laughs> go spend it on alcohol. You could probably build a better roll cage probably then if it's a safety thing probably yeah i agree i don't know just throwing that out there i i I hear you yeah okay (laughs) you read between the lines read what i'm saying it's not your it's not your house (laughs) exactly (laughs) (laughs) i got it (laughs) Uh, yeah so anyway so uh we started trying to figure out you know what would be another vehicle that would fit what we're looking to do that we were going to use the Bronco for. Right. Okay. And what, what is that purpose? The Bronco is going to be a dual purpose, more of an, a long trip multi-day camping vehicle. So quote unquote overlanding, but we want to be able to take it on some more difficult off-road trails. Right. Okay. So we definitely want it to go out to gold Lake, which is not a high standard. I got the Ford out there last year without any issues. The F-150. You, you didn't even hit the rock sliders. I might have tapped him a couple of times. Yeah. See, it wasn't all my fault. (laughs) That one is still bent out of proportion. Yeah. That one might've been, but I think that one was due to me going up to uh, committee crossing in the Ford. (laughs) So (laughs) I went down to the top of committee crossing in the F-150. Yeah. So I definitely hit one out at Sierra track. You did? Okay. When I was dropping, (laughs) um, Randy, Randy off to go look at the repeater. Okay. Randy was on the trip that I smashed to the step in too. All right. I think it's Randy. I think it's Randy's oh, fault. Oh, Randy. All right, buddy. <laughs> We're going to be blaming you here. Radio Randy. <laughs> so anyways, uh, we wanted to be able to do more trails. Like I would love to get a vehicle that can go and do strawberry. Yeah. Like Kermit can pre Kermit can, but it's, it's not like, sorry, strawberry type trails. Okay. So like, I want to go be able to play in Bodie. I don't want to drive Kermit all the way to Bodie. He yeah. can. He could do it just fine. Right. But like if I have something that has adaptive cruise control <laughs> and a heated steering wheel and air conditioned seats, why not take that to Bodie instead? <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah, we wanted to do longer trips like that. Like maybe take a rig and drive it out to Moab. Okay. Mm-hmm. And do some of the trails at Moab, some of the more mild trails and then drive it back home. So we don't have to tow a vehicle yeah. out there. So that kind of stuff, I right? Wouldn't put that past you. And I have thought about not taking Bobcat and taking Charlotte mm-hmm. instead. The Tacoma. Right? In my opinion, stock vehicles do great at Moab because they're much lower center of gravity. Yeah. <laughs> Our rigs aren't made for Moab. No, they're not. Um, they're, they're not good at Moab. So yeah, I don't know. So that, that kind of stuff, right? That's what we're looking for, for a vehicle. 
And uh, we've kind of written off Jeeps just because I, I hate driving Wranglers. It's I, I, the only thing I've come to is that it's the seating position. I don't like the seating position of Wranglers. I don't like how small the windshields are. Well, it's funny because that's what like one of the number one gripes that anybody that comes from an American made car makes fun of the to- the Toyota Tacoma. Uh-huh. They hate the seating position. Yep. It's and I definitely love it. more reclined. Yeah. More lounged, more lounged mm-hmm. than, uh, other American made vehicles that are more upright. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that's a lot of people there's, they make spacer kits for my truck that you put behind on the backside of the seats to lift the rear oh, end really? of the seat up <laughs> to make it more upright. Interesting. Then, uh, <laughs> the comes from factory. So it, that's kind of funny because yeah, that's the, one of the biggest gripes is people hate the seating position in the Toyotas because of that. Yeah. yeah. Where we're so used to it. Yeah. Right. This is, we've had our trucks for so long. Mm-hmm. You know, I've had a Toyota pickup in my life since I was, you know, shit since like two nineteen ninety six. 1996, mm-hmm. you know, I've been, I've been around and having Toyotas. Mm-hmm. It's, oh, I, that's something I've been in the driver's seat of. It's yeah. pretty crazy that I'm used to that. Yeah, I agree. I'm, I'm, I like the seating position of Toyotas. I like that lounged fuel in Toyotas. So yeah, so we've kind of written off Jeeps and I'm like, I don't know. I mean, there's not really that many other options out there. We definitely want an SUV. What about a style. Ford Ranger? We definitely want an SUV <laughs> style, but Ford Explorer, but we need something that's offered capable. And by offered capable, I mean some sort of locking differentials, whether it's okay. just a rear and, uh, you know, front gets, a, a you know, some system like a track or something Chevy Colorado with a camper shell and knock out the weird wall in it. <laughs> <laughs> you can open the back window. Well, we need to be able to get back there and have a pass through for no. camping equipment and whatnot. So anyways, SUV style vehicle and something that we can put bigger tires on. So I want bigger, we want bigger tires. We want traction aid device in the differential of some sort and um a uh, suv style body okay so modern huh you want it to be modern and it, want it to be modern yeah because i was we've both looked and we like the looks of the fj cruise or not the cruises the fj 80s and they're it's extremely capable yeah there's a ton of room inside them right but it doesn't have a lot of the modern amenities for long distance driving in my opinion um like adaptive cruise control it's something i really really want in the next vehicle i get And so, and the other thing is we want it to be able to become sort of a show vehicle for more flight as well. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so it also needs to be able to tow our little camping trailer, which no biggie. That thing weighs maybe 2000 pounds loaded. Right. (laughs) So like almost anything is going to be able to tow it. But Ben from descent off road came by the warehouse last week. Yep. Um, we, we talked some business partnership ideas with, between uh, more flight and descent. And he brought over the new Sequoia that Stella built just got done building for them. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. And it has the uh, twin turbo hybrid engine drivetrain in it. Um, Is that the same one that's going in the Tundra or that you yes. can get in the Tundra? Yep. Got it. So uh, the Tundra and the Sequoia are pretty much the same platforms. Right. Um, they use the same chassis, pretty much, um, yep. same suspension components, pretty much. The Tundra has uh, adjustable airbags. I don't think the Sequoia does. I could be wrong, though. I didn't look into that. But the Sequoia, the TRD Pro, gets a massive rear differential e locker. It has a 10 and a half e locker. 10 right? and a half inch e locker yeah. that's dropout. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and so. It's, I mean, that, that rear axle in the Sequoia is equivalent to like a Dana 70 axle, right? It's massive. It's a it's big, huge, big, huge axle, uh, equivalent to a 10 and a half, uh, Sterling for sure. And so I'm like, man, that's a, that's a nice chunky piece of beef there. The, I got to drive Ben's and he had it on 37s with no modifications, 37 inch tires, no modifications. Really? Yeah. Fender trimming? Not really. Oh, wow. He said it, it rubs a little bit at full lock and stuff, but he said he hasn't modified anything. He put, I think a half an inch leveling kit on it. Wow. Okay. <laughs> and it's fitting the 37s on there. And so I got to drive it around. He's got the roof rack on it. Now the camp, uh, the rooftop tent on it. And, uh, so that's about it. He redid 
I want to say he did a front. He had the front bumper on it. Um, didn't have a rear bumper on it yet, but they're building a rear bumper and swing out for it. Cool. So it had some small light modifications on it, sliders. Okay. And uh, I got to go drive it. And that with the stock gearing in it on 37s on a Sequoia, as heavy as that vehicle is, it scooted. Did it? It got up and went. Nice. But like, are you, so are you comparing that to your Forerunner? I'm comparing it to the F-150. Oh, okay. Yeah. The the twin turbo uh, EcoBoost in the F-150. That's like the earlier model, right? It's It's deceiving though, because you really got to put your foot into the pedal to get it to go. Because otherwise, um, it's just kind of the gas engine going. Okay. And whereas if you once you start really putting your foot into the pedal, you can feel the instantaneous torque of the P2 hybrid motor. Yes. In there. And once that kicks in and starts picking up, it's it gets up and goes. Um, that and the electric motor, you can feel it take over in between the shifts on the transmission. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So it keeps it moving even in between though, the transmission shifting. Even though the transmission's not connected. Yes. Wow. Which was really that was that was pretty cool to feel. I've never felt that before in a vehicle, right? And so that was really interesting. Driving it around was a lot of fun. It was super smooth, super comfy, a really nice ride, uh, plenty of room in the interior, a lot of fun amenities in the interior, uh, captain seats in the middle row. Oh, cool. Uh, bench seat in the rear that has the two fold down sides to it. It was a pretty sweet setup, not going to lie. And so after I got to drive it, I was like, this is actually pretty nice. And with it having a 9,000 pound towing capacity. Yeah, that's insane. <laughs> it's a fucking SUV with a 9,000 pound towing capacity, <laughs> which is crazy. I could tow the forerunner around with yes, it. Yes, you could. Easy. Pretty easy. Yeah. And so I'm like, man, this, and it has the trailer brakes built into the dash. Oh, cool. On the Sequoia as well. Um, it's got the different, uh, terrain modes you can go into. And uh, I mean, it was, I was impressed with it. Very impressed. So after I kind of saw that, I was like, man, if we got this, we could tow around the little camping trailer and we could tow the forerunner to different events. Like we could, I could use the Sequoia to tow the forerunner around. Yeah. And I was like, I wouldn't even need the F-150. The F-150 would just be like a, a, a round town daily truck just to haul shit in. And so I was like, all right, secretary, I think, we, you should consider looking at the Sequoia. So we went down and test drove some. Oh, cool. Um, they only had the limited or the, the, um, not the limited, uh, platinum, platinum, the platinum version in. Okay. They didn't have the TRD pro. So we drove the, I let her drive the platinum around. I was like, doesn't what the, questions do you want to know? Yeah. Doesn't the platinum have better interior than the TRD pro? I didn't really notice any differences between no? the interior. Mm-mm. Oh, Okay. Yeah. I didn't know if it had the bigger screen and the TRD pro doesn't. No, it had the same size screen that uh, Ben's had. Okay. Yeah. And his was the TRD pro. Mm-hmm. Cool. Yeah. Okay. So I she, just want to make sure that you're not getting yourself into trouble, Yeah. you know, for like <laughs> the interior aesthetics versus the more off-road capable. Yeah. All the interiors seemed pretty damn similar between the platinum and the TRD pro. Right. The main differences I noticed with the TRD Pro was uh, the terrain modes you get right. out of it, the rear locking differential, and then a couple of other stuff. Cool. Okay. The another nice thing about the Sequoia is when you put it into four wheel drive, the four low at least, it automatically shuts off all your traction control stuff, and you okay. can do you can do four wheel burnouts pretty easily. Supposedly, I think my Tacoma does that. I think that's a Toyota standard thing. Is when you drop into four low, it does turn off everything automatically. Yeah. Because while I was up at the cabin last time, there was ice on the road on the uphill when mm-hmm. we were leaving. And I did a four wheel burnout and it didn't overcorrect me. Uh, but I w- and I think I was in four wheel high. Oh. But four wheel high should have traction control on. So I, yeah. I'll, I don't know. I'll go over there one day and I'll Play put, it, it. put it through its paces <laughs> and see what it, what it flashes on the dash at me. Yeah. So anyways, she got to drive it. She liked it. It's still a little on the big side from what we want. It's a big vehicle. <laughs> Get the RAV4. That doesn't that doesn't have a, the off-road abilities though. Oh, we could make it. We can make it have the <laughs> off-road abilities, yeah. Right. 
We could put some 32s on it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Uh huh. So, anyways, we're looking at that. And when I looked at the pricing of it, $90,000. Yeah. I'm like, I can't bring myself to spend $90,000 on yeah, a vehicle. It's a lot. Like, I could buy two buggies for that much. <laughs> <laughs> Almost. Yeah, probably yeah. can't buy gold digger, but yeah, you no. could, <laughs> yeah, you could so, get a good buggy for sure. Yeah. Right. And I'm like, I'm like, I can't bring myself to samurai. Spend James 000. would be so pissed at you. Oh my gosh. Should I just go buy the buggy he's looking at right now? <laughs> <laughs> but you can't go on a long road trip in a buggy. No, you can't. Well, not in California, not in California. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I just can't, I can't bring myself to spend $90,000 and she's, a worse spender than I am. Like she's a big time saver. She likes to put money away and just save it all. And I like to spend money on stuff. If I see the value in it and I'm like, I just, I can't, I can't see the value in spending $90,000. Yeah. On this that's thing. crazy. I think my Tacoma was only 36. Wow. Yeah. And so I think right now, so Tacoma with camper shell, we're look. I think no, <laughs> I think right now we're looking at, but new Tacomas now are like, 60. Mm-hmm. That's 50% less than almost 50. No, it'd be 33, 30%. 40% yeah. less than 90,000. Mm-hmm. So I think what we're going to do is I think we're going to wait out and see what the sixth gen forerunner really has to show. It's a while from now. I think it's going to be like two years. Okay. Yeah. So you're just going to hold on and see if you get a Bronco. And if you don't, and we'll you're just gonna, cancel the order we're altogether. We're see what happens with the Forerunner. I think so. As of now, I think so. As of now, the other option. And you've been rotating cars through this, like I talk about all the mods I want to do to Bobcat, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> well, we had our mindset, but nobody can deliver us one. So, yeah. Anyways, that's the Bronco update. So, yeah. Let's see what else do we got here. Oceana Dunes. Oceana Dunes. Fun update with Oceana Dunes. Okay, I'm ready. I think the last thing that's been talked about is that the APCD, the Air Pollution Control District in San Luis Obispo, has decided that the Scripps Institute uh, findings, which has now been officially peer-reviewed and published, which means they're pretty irrefutable now. However, the APCD has not acknowledged, and neither has the OHMVR, has acknowledged that 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 is the case. Of course. Yep. Um, however, they have for the listeners that might not be caught up. Do you want to talk or do you want me to talk very briefly about sure uh, yeah. what it is? So yeah. the Scripps Institute. So, well, let, let me go back a little farther. So, uh, they wanted to close Oceata down dunes down because they were saying that there was a lot of pollutants from primarily off roaders, but just from the dunes in general, flying out into the neighborhoods that are around the beach and saying all these pollutants and dust particles and things are coming from that area into civilization. Yep. So then during COVID and the shutdown and the pandemic, Scripps Institute went and checked up on how the pollutants are doing. The dust Mm -hmm. particles are flying through the air. And they actually found that there was more dust particles flying through the air when nobody was out on the dunes. Well, that and the more important part was not that it was dust particles, um, oh, it was true. P- okay, PM10 yeah. particles, yeah. which are dust particulate typically. They're that size, yes. right? But they found out that less than 14% of the PM10 particles in the air around and surrounding the dunes were dust. Were dust. They were other otherwise they were all naturally occurring salinity. Par- salinity in that area. Yeah. Salt water. Oh, okay. That's essentially what they found uh, oh, made up what is that 86%? 86% of the PM10 particles around Oceana Dunes was salt water in the air. Got it. Less than 14% was due to uh, dust. Dust. And they found out that that percentage was actually higher on days when off-roaders were not out there. Right. <laughs> Compared to years past when yeah. off-roaders are on the dunes. So this was brought to attention in the courts. And mm-hmm. and so now you were saying that it's been peer-reviewed and... Yep. um cited. Um, it's been and published and published in yeah, published peer reviewed and published, which in the scientific community, once something is peer reviewed and published, it's usually taken as like pretty much that's, that is the yeah. case. That's what's going on. Correct. And so 
Yeah, which means that with this art, with the Scripps Institution findings now being peer reviewed and published, it puts a very, very, very strong case on somebody owing the OHV fund in California twenty three million dollars. Ooh, mm-hmm. that's nice. Yep. Yeah, because didn't one of the courts say, or didn't they go in and fight for all the money back, right, that they had to spend to kind of fight this battle that that's one of the lawsuits yeah. that friends of Oceana dunes has put into the systems Got it. Yeah. Um, within the past few months. So, so yep. there's a strong case that $23 million are going to be coming back into the, OHV, the fund. OHV funds. Yep. Cool. And to make matters even worse, it has now also been leaked from a former uh, state what is it? State engineer. I should probably really look up what his title is, but I'm just going off of a state employee. It was a state employee that was in charge of a lot of the research out at Oceana Dunes. He reported to the state and the APCD that the findings were not what they were claiming like six years ago. Oh, really? Uh-huh. Like a while ago. Of and course. the state conveniently reassigned him. <laughs> Oh yeah. <laughs> After he reported his findings. And so now that that has been leaked as well, it creates an even stronger argument that somebody owes the OHV fund $23 million. <laughs> wow. <laughs> because the OHV fund is who's been paying for all the dust mitigation out there. Okay. Yeah. So it wasn't all lawyer fees for fighting the battle. No, I think it it's was... mainly just for the, the uh, costs of the abatement order. Got it. Yeah. Maybe now we can open up more land. Maybe. Right? Maybe once we get our $23 million, then we can fight and get up more yep. land back. Because a big chunk of the, I think the last big closure of the dunes was closed because of the, the, the finding that came out that stated, oh my God, there's a shit ton of PM tarp 10 particles in the air. Yeah. And that a hundred percent of it is dust caused by off-roaders. Sure. And after that report came out, um, they shut down another massive chunk of the dunes. So it's looking like now that that report has been proven to be false, there's a, another strong case. I, that might be another lawsuit that friends has in right now. That'd be cool to get that reinstated and reopened. Heck yeah. We got to watch mm-hmm. out for the snowy plover though. Yep. Yep. Definitely. <laughs> so good thing. They only stay on the beach. Yep, <laughs> exactly. So anyways, that's uh, the latest update with Oceana Dunes. Nice. I liked yep. it. Uh-huh. That's a fun one. Um, Rubicon Trail update. Yes. Um, so uh, all the storms have passed. Yes, they have. And the trail is still closed. Yes, it is. So it's kind of starting to look like maybe it, the trail wasn't shut down for public safety. That I would agree Question with that. Question mark, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> during the storms, which was the state, which was the reason why the state of emergency powers were granted to Eldorado County so that they can control public safety during the storms and using their state of power, a state of emergency powers, they shut down the trail and it's not reopened yet. Nope. So turns out that the board of supervisors got paid <sighs> off. <laughs> no, <laughs> God, that would be amazing if they did. Uh, no, they have, they've, and this is what I'm concerned about because they have stated they really want to work with the users of the trail and the stakeholders of the trail to come up with a plan for future management of the trail that makes everybody work together. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure that's what the 2013 yeah. easement agreement did. I'm pretty sure that's already <laughs> written down. I'm pretty and sure you guys that. did not know about it. Exactly. And you guys bypassed it to begin with. So why don't we just go back to what was already written down and make sure everybody fucking follows it? Yeah. So what they're doing is uh, Rubicon trail foundation has reached out to the board members and they've been having conversations, good conversations with the board members and stating that they want to make an addendum to the 2013 easement agreement so that situations like a state of emergency situation could be accounted for. Because in the 2013 easement agreement, there was no rules about what to do in a state of emergency. State of emergency happens. We just kind of get to make shit up and hopefully make the right decision. Right. Which they didn't because they were fooled by the DOT. But that's another story. Right. But we've the, already also about. the state of emergency didn't happen when the closure happened. Exactly. It yeah. happened a week after. 10 days. 10 11, days. 11 days. 10 after. days after the closure. Yep. Then the state of emergency happened. Yep. <laughs> 
<laughs> so they use the state of emergency to close the trail retroactively. Yes. When really what they did was they did it to save somebody's ass Probably. because a big lawsuit was coming. <laughs> Sure. Anyway, so I'm not I'm not saying or insinuating anything, just saying what I think <laughs> reading between the lines. So anyways, Rubicon Trail Foundation is working with the Board of Supervisors to put in a lot of work to re not negotiate, but bring everybody to the table to talk about this addendum they're going to add to the 2013 easement agreement that is going to allow for a few bit more stipulations. And it's also going to make things, I think, a little bit more restrictive which I think is going to be a good thing because it's going to be having the closure be more restrictive means that it's going to be less likely that closures will happen. Got it. Not more restrictive to the trail. Correct. Okay. Yeah. I think that they're going to have the, the reasons why the trail can close is going to be more restrictive. <clears throat> so, and it's going to be hopefully more data driven from what I've gathered talking to the people that I have talked to, it sounds like that's what they're planning, what they're aiming okay. for. Um, you can't just go to the board of supervisors and be like, well, I don't think it's safe. And then they go, you know what? I think you're right. <laughs> and then just shut it down. Yeah. So it's going to be, have to be more data driven. And uh, so anyways, there's a big meeting on February 13th. Okay. February 13th at the California four wheel drive associations office in Sacramento. Got it. Because they have a big meeting room. Yeah. So it's a nice venue for it. Roger Salazar, who is a big off-roader, and he's also on the OHMVR commission. Got it. Okay. Um, He is trying to put this together to bring all the voices together that have a stake in the Rubicon Trail. So all the stakeholders, all the users. So off-road clubs, uh, RTF, Corva, Cal4, anybody out there, if there's any hiking groups that are up in desolation that kind of hikes through the Rubicon as well. There is. I know there are. Um, We were out on the trail and met them. (laughs) And one of them came through. Yeah. So um, they're all, everybody is being invited into this to talk about what we should consider moving forward with the trail. What are going to be the new standards moving forward from user groups? Yep. So that's happening February 13th. If anybody has input they want to give on that, make sure you're there at the meeting. Make it happen. It's at 5 p.m. at the California Four-Wheel Drive Association office in Sacramento. I'll put that information down in the show notes if you are interested and you want to go and you don't know exactly where everything is or the time. I'll put that info down in the show notes so you can just check it out real quick. Cool. Um, So yeah, that's the the new thing. Um, And RTF is has uh, said that they're not going to be filing any lawsuits. uh, And currently nobody is filing lawsuits or looking at filing lawsuits. That's Uh, nice of them. That is nice (laughs) of them, unfortunately. (laughs) However, uh, it does not seem like Eldorado Sheriff's office is enforcing any closures. (laughs) So I will, I will just put that out there for everybody. Let's see. What else do we have to talk about? I went snow wheeling this weekend. Hold on. I want to talk just a hair more on Rubicon. Um, Okay. Did you have a chance to listen to Big Rich's interview with Ken Hauer, the Rubicon Trail president, R- RTF, RTF president. president? Yep. I did not listen to that yet. It's a pretty good episode. Really? Yeah. There is Ken Hauer knows his shit. Ken Hauer was one of the original people there that helped write the 2013 easement agreement. Right. Yes. Yes. He knew so much more mm-hmm. than so many other people in mm-hmm. that damn room mm-hmm. when they were talking about it. Yep. And a lot of information came out on the big rich podcast. Um, I don't know what the episode number was, but it was his most re- one of his most recent ones. Yeah. And it was freaking fantastic. So that's cool. But it's also cool to hear Ken Howard's background. I didn't know anything really about him. So if yeah. you're interested in RTF and the president of RTF go and an insane guy that's running for a second term as president mm-hmm. for RTF, which I think there's only two other people that have done this. Oh yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. Uh, go check out the big rich podcast episode. 147. 147. Thank yep. you. Yeah. No, uh, rich Klein was actually at the board of supervisors meeting. Yes. Yeah, he was. So he, he stood went up, up to in the person. Stand. Yep. yep. He went there in person and, um, got up to the stand to help give public comment about what was going on. So a uh, huge shout out to rich and Ken, both those guys uh, gave comment there at the board of supervisors meeting as well. And Ken, Ken definitely knows his shit. I've had quite a few conversations back and forth with Ken about this whole situation and trying to help convey what the public can do Yeah, to help the situation kind of yeah. thing. Right. And I think didn't, haven't they sent scouting parties into the Rubicon to see how things are. County Parks and Rec? Yeah. Has, yes. 
Has there been findings of that? Um, yes, there are official reports. I cannot say how I know about them. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe you shouldn't say. But what there they are, are there are official reports that stated. Okay. County Parks and Rec went out to on the trail right before the storms came through. Okay. To look at the areas. Right. Um, the seven areas that are listed in the easement agreement to keep an eye on for standing water. And they found that they couldn't find the areas and that there was plenty of snow on the trail. And there's an official right. document that states that. Got it. I thought they went out fairly recently to do another report. They were out there, let's see, Saturday. Okay. Um, this last Saturday. Yeah. Yeah. And what's funny, <laughs> here's another funny thing about their decision making here. Um, apparently, it is way too unsafe for the public to be out there at all. Hmm. But they sent one singular employee in one vehicle out to scout. Yeah, that, that sounds area. safe. Right? <laughs> Have they never heard of the buddy system? Were they not Boy Scouts? Come nah. on. <laughs> Which just, this just, again, goes to show that they do not understand what we do. They don't understand snow. And they don't understand snow. They don't understand winter recreation. I don't think they understand recreation in general. No. And I'm just Maybe like, and these a are the satellite people. phone. <sighs> He did have a repeat. He, they were on the 805. Oh, okay. So the guy that went out there was communicating back to the manager of the trail um, over the 805 repeater. That's when I heard them. And I was like, wait a minute. And he said that um, he made a comment about APRS over the repeater too. And so I looked him up and I know him. So I'm going to leave his name out of this, but I looked him up and I kept an eye on him all day on Saturday on APRS oh. watching his tracks on APRS. How far did he get? He made it decently far. Okay. He made it to roughly the original Wentworth Springs area. And then he sat there for two hours. <laughs> so I don't know if he got stuck and had fun getting himself unstuck or, or, or he went on a hike or he went on a hike or just stopped and had lunch and enjoyed the outdoors. Cause I know that guy is a big off-roader. Well, maybe they, they had faith in him. <laughs> maybe. Um, however, I was out there. Sorry, they went out there on Friday because I was out there the day after. Okay. On Saturday and the snow was fucking soft. Yeah. Like if I wouldn't have gone out, I do. And I, I go out by myself and I have confidence going out by myself. I wouldn't have gone out by myself in that. Oh. Wow. Okay. <laughs> the snow is soft on, on the 40 inch, uh, Yokohama's and with, uh, somebody behind me on 42 inch Irox, we were both having troubles. Wow. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, the county decided to send one person out completely by himself. <laughs> yeah. Even though it's too unsafe for people to be out there. So anyways, I thought that was a uh, highly ironic and uh, laughable. Anyways, I went out the following day on Saturday with um, some guys and uh, one of the people in the group was Dimitri. This was Sunday. No, we went out Saturday. Oh, you went out Saturday. Yep. Oh, okay. Uh, Dimitri from Stellar Built. Yeah. Because he just got some fucking Ruby tracks. I know he did. <laughs> they look so cool. I am so pissed at oh him, but they God. look so badass. Yes. And I'm only mad at him because I'm jealous. That's, that's pretty much what I told him too. Yeah. I said, I fucking hate you, Dimitri. And just to let you know, I'm going to buy some adapters for eight lug eight on one seventy adapters. And I'm going to come over and steal those. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> so what is, Oh, because you're eight on one. He's on Toyota Axel. So Giant. I can steal them. You can steal them and burn them on your Tacoma. Bobcat on Bobcat too. Even better. Ooh, ooh, ooh. You'd have plenty of clearance on Bobcat. Hell yeah. You wouldn't have fender issues like Dimitri did. No, <laughs> which we'll talk about here in a second. <laughs> yeah. So anyways, uh, it was the maiden voyage of, he put it on the, the Aussie taco. Yeah. The Ute, the Ute, um, that they did the flatbed with the mitts alloy, uh, flatbed on it, the mm -hmm, cargo mm -hmm. system there. And man, it looked, it looks good. It just looks so good. And, but I've, I've never wheeled with a full vehicle on tracks before. Yeah. I've, um, I've never been in person with one. Well, maybe on like at a show or something, but never right. off-roaded. Yeah. And so like, I understand the concept of tracks or would it be off snowed? Off snowed, on, on snowed. snowed. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I understand the concept of tracks and why, what the benefit is. They are so great. What the yeah. benefits are. And How do you air them down? You just slice them, <laughs> stab <laughs> them with a knife. No, um, Spice, what, what, seep them, sipe them, sipe them. Yeah. You sipe <laughs> them more. 
But anyway, so like the whole point of tracks is uh, to reduce your ground pressure, right? right? Mm -hmm. It distributes the load of your vehicle over a much greater surface area, which then decreases the amount of pressure your vehicle puts per square inch on the ground. Right. And so I was like, okay, you know, I'm going to lead because Dimitri has, this is first time out in the tracks. And so he wasn't sure quite how they were going to behave. If he was going to have to do some extra trimming, you know, are they going to dig into the body at some point? You know, how's it going to work if we come across a big snow drift, they have to go down and back up. And so we're like, all right, we'll just put Dimitri kind of at the end. Um, and then me and uh, we had started off with five rigs wow. all together. Was BG up there? Uh, yeah. Oh, he was cool. riding with Dimitri. Oh, was he? Yep. Okay. Yeah. And so uh, we started off with five Why rigs. Why didn't he bring his rig? I don't know. He didn't want to for whatever reason. He wanted to ride in that. <laughs> yeah. That I think ute. I think um, um, Tiffany would have done better than two of the Jeeps that were with us. Oh, really? So, yeah. Uh, two of the Jeeps that were with us, there were four-door JKs on... One of them was on Toyo MTs, which are shitty tire in the snow, in my opinion, just because they have such tough sidewalls. You can't really air them down to get a nice big footprint with okay. them. And then the other one was on another tire that kind of mimicked the Toyos, but it was even like closer together treads. So the, oh. the void ratio was even less than the Toyos are tread, right? <laughs> no, I don't remember what they were, but they were, they were struggling. They couldn't get any traction. They kept a high centering on the diffs. The snow was really soft and it was like that really sugary kind of snow that doesn't pack yeah. in at all. Okay. Yeah. That so stuff sucks. As soon as you spin a tire, which is going to happen, you just dig down. Yeah. Which means you end your diffs end up in the center part very quickly and very easily. And since they were on, I think one was on 35s and one was on a really worn down 37s. And then I was on 40s. Another one, the TJ was on 42 inch IROX. And then there was Dimitri on tracks. <laughs> They were just catching on high singer on everything. So before long, we decided to park the two JKs on the side of the trail. We had them hop in with people and then continued on down the trail. Cool. Okay. And before long, I got to the point where I was struggling. And so I was like, well, let's put Dimitri in front. We know that it's working now. Um, everybody's having a lot of fun watching him just play going back and forth across the tracks, using, yeah. going in the deep powder, not having any issues whatsoever. Then everybody else who goes in the deep powder immediately just sinks and gets stuck. Wow. And we're just like, all right, let's have Dimitri go front and then we'll just follow in his tracks. That didn't even work. No, that's how good the tracks, the Ruby tracks worked on that Tacoma. Wow. Okay. How little of ground pressure they put on the ground, on the snow was that we couldn't even stay in the tracks because it wasn't packed in enough because there wasn't enough ground pressure to pack it in. Wow. That's insane. That's how good those things are working. Well, if you think about it, what if you're fully aired down, you make a contact patch one inch or a yep. little bit bigger than your 13 and a half. So maybe 16 inches circular. I would say yes. Yeah, 16. Let's just say 16 by 16, 16, just by, to give yes, it a, a circle of 16 inch diameter circle. Roughly. Yeah. Right. And how long is one of his tracks? They are 48 inches long at the base. I believe so. Yeah. Four so feet on the base. Four feet. They're four. Each one is four <laughs> feet. I think so. Yeah. Holy cow. Yeah. Four so feet long. You have four of them that are planted that are 48 inches long by whatever width he is at. And I want to say they're 14 inches wide, 14, 16, 15 inches wide. Yeah. Look at the difference in contact yeah. patch. So let's just say, um, if, just for easy calculations, a tire, my 1350s air down enough where I get a 16 by 16 contact patch. Square patch. Square patch. Just for easy math. So that's 200. And this is what we were talking about on a previous episode, yeah. like getting into the nerdiness of tracks. Yes, I. Um, 256 square inches. Okay. And say my vehicle weighs 5,000 pounds and there's four of those. So 256 times four. So I have a square inches on the snow of contact of 1,024 square inches. Okay. Divided by 5,000. Um, we're looking at about five pounds per, per square inch. Per inch. Yep. So five pounds per square inch is roughly what the forerunner lays down in the snow. Okay. Guesstimating rough sure. just for numbers sake. Dimitri's got on those Ruby tracks. So you could just, let's just do one track. <laughs> now do 768. For one square track. inches, square inches for one track. All right. Now times four times four, 3,072. And then what at 3,800? I'd say, let's just say 4,000 to be sure. nice. 
So he's 1.25 pounds per square inch. Yeah. So he's pretty much four times. Four times less, light, less pressure. Ground huh? pressure than the Forerunner does, roughly. And that's just guesstimating, making up numbers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? That's the magic of tracks. That's insane. So um, it was very impressive watching Dimitri in the tracks um, and, and watching the tracks work. There was at one point when we were just going to try and pull the JKs through the trail and um, the tracks got just the anchored down because of the JK and they just sunk themselves down in the snow, but they still kept going forward while sinking. Really? Yes. Wow. And so after we uh, unhooked, we winched the JK and got the strap loose so he could move backwards so that we got the JK pulled backwards. And then Dimitri backed out of the holes there. Um, and there was a hole in the snow about two feet undercut into the snow, like this cave of where the tracks were. And I wow. was like, that is, and all he did was he just backed right out. Like, yeah, like it was nothing, nothing. And I was like, Oh my God, <laughs> I need <laughs> a set of these. Crazy. <laughs> yes. I need tracks. And so I finally got to the point in the day where we're trying to get to, um, somebody's private cabin, their private property so that they hadn't been in since the storm started. And so they wanted to get in there and check the snow loads on the cabin. See if there's any trees down, see if a tree came down on the cabin. And so that was the goal and for clear the, day. the roof, right? And clear the roof as much as you could. Yeah. And so, uh, we got to a point where it's like, I'm struggling and the 42 inch I rocks are struggling, but Dimitri is still just like right out on the road. And so we're finally like, this is going to, we're not going to make it before dark. Like you guys just need to go. Sure. And so they did, they left and left me and the TJ to try and see if we could make it to the cabin. (laughs) And we never did. Wow. But at one point, apparently we learned the limits of the tracks. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> so, um, it got to a point where, uh, there was just a big kind of a snow drift where there was an under the snow. Uh, it was essentially a snow bridge, right? Yeah. And as he went over the snow bridge collapsed and then he had to come down and come back up the other side of it. And the taco was so long that he couldn't get fully level before coming back up the other side. Yeah. And so tracks, the big problem with tracks is, is rotated. They no, they in fresh powder, it just dug him down into the snowbank oh, okay. on the other side. So did he damage his front bumper area? No, no, oh. no, nothing got damaged, but he couldn't get out. Oh no, <laughs> he couldn't. Cause he came down far enough where if he backed up the tracks in the back started pushing him under the other snowbank. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> so he's at this spot now where the front of the rig and the back of the rig are both embedded in the snowbanks. <laughs> Have you seen the pictures of these people that are driving past the road close signs and falling into these sinkholes out in like Wilton area? No, like there's a section of road that is completely washed out. Mm-hmm. and like eight feet deep and people are driving past oh, the road yes. close sign yes. and falling into this hole. Yeah. And those are not snow covered. It's, it's very obvious that there's sinkholes around. Well, no, th- yeah, but yes. this is just a, uh, it's an open area. This is just somebody like, you know, in the middle of on a, like a levee road, Yeah, you know, not out here in normal land, not yeah. snow level or snow area, you yep. know? Yeah. And so you're picturing me picturing Dimitri stuck down trying to drive out of this hole reminds me of these people that are driving into sinkholes. <laughs> kind of. Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, uh, they ended up getting some shovels out and, uh, two people hiked up to the cabin. They were only like 200, 300 yards away, something like that. So they hiked up to the cabin, check on the cabin while everybody else popped out a couple shovels and dug out the snow bank behind the Tacoma. Got it. And, uh, Brennan BG, he goes, he goes, man, I fucking shoveled like a 25 foot ramp for the truck. <laughs> I was like, welcome to snow wheeling, Brennan. Yep. And so, uh, yeah, they got the, the Tacoma out of there by shoveling a 20 foot ramp behind it out. And then it just so backed it right would, out so that it wouldn't dig itself down. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and so once they did that, Dimitri was like, next upgrade for the Tacoma is a rear winch. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, if I had a rear winch, it would have been out of that. No problem. Does he have a front winch? Yeah. Okay. But the front end was more down into the ground kind of thing. So yeah. uh, Other than that, that rig did amazing. Cool. And it was really fun to watch it. And now I'm kind of like, Hmm, do I spend $90,000 on a Sequoia or do I spend $12,000 on a set of tracks? (laughs) 
Well, <laughs> I think you've already answered that question. I think I have too. <laughs> I think that your 90K is not going to happen for a few years. So you might as well spend the 12K now. I like the way you think, Jimmy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So there might be, there might be some tracks in my future after I do the axles and suspension. Yeah. But you don't need them till next year. I know. I just need to get them before next wheeling season. So as long as I'm a good squirrel and save up $12,000 this year, I should be able to get some tracks for next winter. Nice. Maybe you can store your almonds away. Yeah. Hey Jake, if you want to send some more almonds, I can sell them on eBay. That'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to need to start selling uh, like going down to uh, sperm banks or something soon. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I don't remember what else that what what else we had to cover, but we're well into this episode. So let's call it here. I remember something else that I did. Okay. And it'll be quick. Mm -hmm. uh, remember a while ago how I was installing some Alpha Rex headlights and I had an issue? Yes. So Alpha Rex sent out, actually it was Tacoma Beast uh, sent out huh. uh, the module. Okay. My buddy bought all the parts from Tacoma Beast. And I contact Alpha Rex because their product wasn't working. But then they, the full circle was I, we needed to contact Tacoma Beast to get the proper part. And then Alpha Rex would reimburse them or whatever. Okay. So Tacoma Beast, actually, my buddy said customer service from Tacoma Beast, two thumbs up. They were awesome. Sent stuff out. Nice. Called them. They answered. They sent the product out super fast. Those and guys do seem very on it, passionate, and, and care about the people. Yeah. I've met them a couple times now at different events and too. they've, every time I've met them, I've, I've always got the vibe that they're stand up people. Yeah. So. They, they seem like great people. Mm -hmm. I've always worked with uh, Yoda mafia, um, on my stuff uh, more than I've ever done anything with Tacoma beast. But every time I've met Mateo, he seems like a good guy. Mm -hmm. Yep. Anyways, the module came out to us. We plugged it in. Everything worked fine. We hooked it up this time. No problems. And then they also sent out um, fog light brackets because we had, well, when we were trying to install them last time, we had two rights and we didn't have a left. Uh -oh. So we had to stop that project. So they sent out um, another, well, they sent out a left this time. And then those went in super easy and everything buttoned together fine. And we were done in a matter of hours. Nice. With some bullshitting. So, okay. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. that, that project, we can check that one off and done. So Sweet. everything worked fine once we figured out that the module was bad. Cool. And swapped that out. Yeah. Awesome. I did get the uh, harness and everything for the electric parking brake calipers. Oh, that's what it was. But I didn't get it before the weekend. So they came in on Monday. Okay. Um, and so I haven't had a chance to hook them up yet, but I did play around with the calipers and got them to actuate. Oh, okay. You put so a bigger battery on it. I put a bigger wires oh, okay. on it so sure. that they could flow the amperage they need. Um, so I figured out how to get them to actuate and it is literally just a matter of reversing the polarity. And so now that I've played around with them a little bit, I think I have an idea of how to do it without having to use Will Woods harness and control box. Oh, really? Yeah. So that's, I was going to talk about that, but we can cover that another day. We'll kind of, once I, once I figure out exactly how to do it and you and I can talk off air and see if we can okay. get yours working without having to order another $700 and shit. That might be nice. Yeah. Cool. Yep. So anyways, that's all the updates, uh, a fun filled episode with updates from all around a bunch of different yeah. news, news and goodies and things that we did. So hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Now uh, we got a fun episode coming up for you Monday where we are also announcing the February giveaway. So uh, make sure you listen on Monday. And um, if any listeners are down at King of the Hammers on Wednesday night, hump day, hump day, Wednesday night, we're going to go do a night run up to the top of Fisher. Oh, cool. So that'll be fun. Uh, we'll have to figure out where to meet people. <laughs> <laughs> we may just have to meet like over near gate four. I think that is at hammers. Um, and then we'll take off for a night run. Oh, let's meet at back door. Cause we have to kind of take off from there anyways. Yeah. The parking area for back door. So there's a, there's a big sand pit there. So let's meet up there Wednesday night, right around sunset. And we'll head up to Fisher and hopefully get to the top of Fisher for sundown. Cool. Yeah. That'll be fun. And then we'll, we'll, we'll figure that out. Well, it's supposed to be a night run. I'll okay. get more details. Yeah. We'll put it on the Facebook page. So pay attention to the Facebook page. Um, and, uh, I'll get details there for everybody. So, yeah. And if you have any questions on that, I'm not going to be down there. Then I'm still, I might come down for Thursday, Friday, but it's a possibility. 
Oh, okay. Uh, or Thursday, Friday, Saturday. I okay. might drive down Wednesday night. We'll see, but gotcha. I won't be down in time for a, a night run. Okay. So, uh, okay. We'll talk. Uh, I'll, we'll get more details. I may modify those plans in. Well, Thursday night, I think we're supposed to be recording a podcast. We can go wheeling afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, but I'm also a possibility. So I wouldn't say okay. change, do a massive change for me yet. Okay. Uh, so, if, but anyway, if you want more details or you want to refine that uh, plan, uh, get a hold of Tyler. Uh, his Instagram is four by four Toyota Tyler. You can get a hold of him there. If you want to talk non KOH stuff with me, you can find me over at Snail Trail four by four. You can always call in and ask a question in regards to almost anything. And mm-hmm. we will answer it at 916 345 4744. That's it. Correct? 4744. Four, That's it. Thank you. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> uh, cool. Emails Jimmy or Tyler at snailtrail4x4.com. I like it. Hopefully, we'll I'll get to see a bunch of you guys down on the lake bed. I have no clue what my plans are. It's kind of fun <laughs> right now doing it this way, but uh, I will have APRS on. And I think I'm setting up an APRS repeater down there. Cool. Yeah, that'll be fun. So if you guys really want to find me, figure out how to use APRS. No, that's not true because the forerunner is going to be in the booth all the time during the day. So I won't always be with the forerunner. All right. Uh, that's about it. If anybody has any questions, feel free to reach out. And Jimmy, any final words for everybody? Thanks for the Ammons. And with that, my friends, keep crawling. I got one for you. I hope you do. You hit that big red button over there. I did. I did indeed. (laughs) What do you got? What do you got? What do you got? Why are balloons so expensive? Uh, because they grow exponentially. It's because of inflation. Oh, I think that's kind of what I was trying to allude to. I didn't know how to word it. (laughs) I don't think I got it correctly. (laughs) No, I answered it. No, I got it right, Jimmy. (laughs) 